Hello and welcome. My name is Sydney Schindel. I am a certified nutritionist and I'm so excited to be here tonight to share a little bit of information. And when I mean a little bit, we are just scraping the surface uh, of what it means to talk about uh, pre and post workout nutrition. So for this evening, we are going to dive into the foundational work that I love to use with clients um, to make sure that you know uh, the basics of how to understand what your clients need and when. And in this talk, we're really gonna start by layering the foundations of what you are probably already aware of, of, of macros, but we also need to gauge that to our clients. So I do wanna add in this little bit of coaching to tonight's talk because you can give someone all the tools in the toolbox, but if they don't know how to use the tool, then it might not be the right tool for them just yet. So let's jump in. Uh, just first and foremost, yes, my name is Sydney. I am a nutritionist. I'm the founder of a company called Veritas Wellness. So I'm a clinical nutritionist. I work in practice uh, in New Westminster, BC, but I do see a lot of clients online from Vancouver and beyond. Um, and I work with all sorts of clients. I see clients who are struggling to manage diabetes, who've been given a diagnosis and now have to understand how to measure their blood sugar. Been working with clients who are looking to lose weight, to gain weight, uh, to tone up as a water people will put it and then they dive into understanding that there's so much more to it than that. Uh, I work with sports nutrition clients, love working with sports nutrition clients, it's a lot of fun. I uh, work with people who experience chronic pain, digestive concerns, issues sleeping and so much more. So a big part of what I do in my clinical practice is teaching. I love to teach, I love to put tools in people's toolboxes and I translate a lot of my past experience in coaching uh, as a synchronized swimming coach into what I do with, with my clients. And even when I teach in webinars like this, because my goal is to give people the why and put the right tool in that toolbox at the right time. I also do a lot of public speaking. I am the co-founder of a workplace wellness company called Vallejo Wellness. We do a lot of nutrition and movement-based wellness initiatives around the city. And I am a former synchronized swimmer, or as it's now called artistic swimming, but it will forever be synchronized swimming in my heart. Uh, and I am a current coach and I'm actually uh, training at the moment to take a master swimmer to Japan this summer. So really excited to be back in the coaching seat and coaching some master's levels athletes this year. And when I'm not doing all of that and not working in clinical practice, I love to teach and I teach uh, at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. So I teach nutritionists how to be, or future nutritionists, how to be nutritionists. And I've created many webinars for InfoFit. And if you have not taken our certified sports performance and fitness nutrition specialist course, which is basically like a holistic nutrition for holistic nutrition for personal trainer course that we developed, uh, I was the co-creator of that course. So I love to teach. And for tonight, we are going to be focusing on the pre and post nutrition, uh, pre and post workout nutrition side of things. And I, before I get there, I want to see if there are any rumors that are coming up because I know there's so, there's so much information out there and a lot of it is opposing. There'll be a lot of people in one camp or the other, this or that, fat or carbs, uh, too much protein, too little protein. And there are so many rumors out there. So if you want to pop in the chat box, I would just love to hear what's going around these days or what seems confusing to you uh, and here are a couple of prompts for you so what are some of the common things that you hear about sports nutrition that you want answered and please feel free to pop that in the chat box and if it goes outside what we're chatting about tonight I'll do my best to get to that at the end but hopefully we can answer some of those questions as we go through this chat and another prompt for you is are there any commonly accepted statements that you just want fact checked because maybe you scratch your head and you're like, you know, I read that somewhere or I heard that somewhere, but then someone told me the complete opposite. So what are some of those rumors or some of those confusing things that you've been hearing about online or in textbooks? Soy food increases estrogen levels. Ah, it's an interesting one. Yeah, we'll save that one for the chat at the end. Hopefully I can get to that one. Anything else that's coming up? Client asks, is it always the more protein, the better? Ooh, we are gonna actually talk about that one today when we go through the macros and explain a little bit about timing of that. 
Someone else asked, carb loading pre-workout. Yes, super excited to chat about that. There's actually really interesting data that shows you kind of how much carbs you should be having pre-workout and why you should understand how to time carbohydrates because there's a finite amount of carbs that we can use in one sitting and otherwise it, it doesn't end up getting used properly and can actually work against you. So we will get to that one in tonight's chat. Amazing. How about pre-workout chemicals? Ooh, this one I actually saved. Um, I just saved actually solely for food. We're not talking about pre-workout protein. Sorry, uh, pre-workout um, like supplements as far as hitting a pre-workout or hitting um, BCAAs or caffeine. Uh, but yeah, they actually do make a difference as far as thinking about how that affects your insulin sensitivity as well as how how much sugar you actually release so if i get time at the end i would love to answer that one too is creatine useful for lifting weights oh my gosh we need to take the sports nutrition course um course that we made because we answer all of these questions in there uh, but creatine is useful for lifting weights Creatine is actually a natural compound, fun fact, and I will answer this one now because I think it's interesting. Uh, we actually will have creatine in our body. We make it internally as, as um, animals, as mammals, uh, but we can use it to load up our muscles and it allows for a kind of a fuller feeling. Um, but the cool thing about how creatine works is when you take it, it allows for more creatine to be in your system for the phosphocreatine cycle, uh, which is one of our cycles of how we recycle energy or kind of create energy in our, in our um, energy systems. And if you have more of that hanging around hypothetically you will basically reduce or lengthen the amount of time it takes to being tired but um, there's also the aesthetic benefit because where creatine goes water goes so you end up looking more full in your muscles oh my gosh there's so many questions i'll just open a few more here and then i'll leave the rest for the end root vegetables better than veggies growing above earth depends on what you're looking for um, they have different benefits and we're going to chat about that when we go through carbs tonight uh, whole food carbohydrates in a nutshell are way better than just counting your macros because you're getting these amazing nutrients so root vegetables can be really useful as a carb source for starch in comparison to the ones that grow above the ground that are going to be more of your fiber source oh my gosh I'm very excited to answer this next question i will um, actually get to this with reina have, do you have to get protein within that window of 30 minutes if not you're going to lose all your gains you're going to be very surprised to hear the answer I have for you here because the uh, men's magazines got that backwards for a very long time. Um, is there such a thing as eating too much vegetables? Yes, definitely. Um, too much fiber is not always a good thing for people. I see that a lot in digestive practice. Um, what to eat for optimal performance, pre and post. Yeah, we're going to go through that. Um, pre and post workout and age does it make a difference yes in particular for females it does because as females age hormones change and so we will dive into that one um, oh my gosh post workout half an hour that is such a big rumor and we're going to go through that one tonight eating a date before exercise and eat breakfast around 11 yeah we're going to chat about timing um, I know love to know what recommendations are for client nutrition and um, exercise who've been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. I see a lot of us in practice chronic fatigue and I see a lot of fibromyalgia and just pain syndromes. Um, there's a lot more going on there. Um, there's a lot more. So that's something, Christina, if you want to send me an email, we can chat about or even um, it, it's something just diving deeper because if you're feeling tired all the time, that has to do with hormones. And if you have fibromyalgia, that also has to do with inflammation. So the support goes above and beyond even what we're going to discuss today. So many things, nutrition for cardio versus strength. Today we're talking about strength training. So we'll be going through just strength training, not endurance training today or cardiovascular training, um, but that could be a talk for another day. Anabolic window, capital letters help. Yeah, we're gonna chat about that. Menopause, chat a little bit about that. And best for vegetarian diets, we're gonna chat about that. Oh my gosh, I am so excited. There's some great questions in here, and I'm going to do my best to answer as many of them as possible in the form of uh, this webinar. So without further ado, let's dive in. All right, so goal for this talk is to revisit the famous macronutrients. We're going to start there because there's a lot to unpack and we're going to discuss for the purpose of this webinar requirements for strength training only. Endurance training actually requires very not extremely different but more um, there's a little bit more subtleties to endurance training as far as what you're eating intra intra workout but also pre and post workout in comparison to strength training there's 
different amounts of the macros that should be um, focused on during strength versus endurance training. And also as a result, the type of body that you work with when someone is an endurance athlete versus a strength athlete is different and they require slightly different things. So for the sake of this chat, we're going to be only focusing on strength training. We'll talk about the macronutrients from uh, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and talking about how to find them on your plate, uh, the amount that should be required for your average athlete um, or your kind of high performance athlete or your weekend warrior. And we'll also talk about what that looks like in food. So chatting about some go-to snacks, chatting about how you can get those nutrients in um, before a workout and after and what that looks like. I'm talking about timing. So thinking about that window and what, what exactly is that anabolic window? So I hope to dispel some myths there um, that we've kind of heard over and over again. And I want to make a huge point in this discussion that there is a difference actually between some of the macronutrient requirements and the timing requirements for um, males versus females. So if you have male parts, male hormones versus female parts and female hormones, your nutrient timing is going to be a little bit different and your nutrient requirements are also going to be different. So I want to make a special note about that because uh, it's been ignored for a really long time, but in the last five, 10 years, there's been a huge explosion of research that has focused on the differences so we can really support our athletes uh, no matter if they're male or female. We'll also chat about proper hydration and because I'm a nutritionist and I'm a holistic nutritionist, I also want to talk about the fact that you are not just what you eat, you're actually a product of what you're able to digest and absorb and assimilate. So I want to also share a little bit about the factors that affect how much you actually absorb as far as those nutrients go, because you could be eating all the macros, you could be counting everything, but you might not actually be digesting and absorbing it properly. And so that can make a big difference to, to your goals and to your gains. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions and I love to help. So I'm going to do my best to get to them. Okay, I promise. Um, last but not least, and not everyone loves to hear this. And to be honest, when I work with clients with sports nutrition, a lot of them don't like to hear this, but I want to touch note on the end here about why we should honor recovery because the recovery days really matter. It's not just about the timing of that anabolic window or what you eat 30 minutes before a workout. It actually matters what you eat on your days off. And having enough days off is another another one there. So let's jump in. So as we go through this session, the goal is to take in this information for you as a trainer and for as someone who teaches and guides clients. But we also need to remind ourselves as well as our clients that we need to focus on not just counting calories or punching things into an app for the sake of hitting your macros and that yes can gain traction and we've seen people hit amazing goals by just counting your macros but the thing is the body doesn't care about calories the body requires adequate energy in order to function and perform so if we're thinking about optimal performance if we're thinking about function if we're thinking about hitting prs if we're thinking about looking a certain way yes calorie counting and macro counting can get you to a certain point. But if you're not focusing on the quality of those macros, then that's going to lead to a sputtering out at some point. It's like only putting gas in your car and never checking the engine um, oil, never checking the um, coolant, never checking anything else. And at some point, the car is gonna be a little bit upset. So energy should be understood as more than just calories and the body really does require adequate amounts of proteins carbohydrates and fats in the right amount to function but beyond what we can see and beyond what we can really count and measure roughly as macros through um calculators or for if you're weighing your food the body also requires these things that we can't see and these things that actually make our macronutrients run and subsequently our entire bodies run. They're like the cogs that actually like make the machine function. And these are your cofactors or your coenzymes, um, also known as vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids and phytochemicals. So things that we find in the food that we eat, vitamins and minerals, um, essential fatty acids and phytochemicals don't, you can't really see them, save for a few that actually show up as colors. So many antioxidants are very bright in color and we can see that quite clearly in our food. Whereas things like vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin C, you can't see them. You can't see those things. So we often forget about them when we focus on macros. So my kind of caveat to everything I'm going to say in this webinar is that please don't just count your macros. You have to count the micros because at some point 
that's going to matter more because if you don't have enough of those then you actually physically cannot break down your protein you cannot break down your carbohydrates you cannot mobilize fatty acids to um, through the process of beta oxidation to turn them into ketones unless you have vitamins and minerals and antioxidants they actually are what's required to make all of those steps happen to turn your food into energy and to keep you healthy Another note is that when we start to count macros, especially for the pursuit of aesthetic goals, sometimes we start to cut calories and we get into hypocaloric states. And while I guess I understand that there are sports that require this like bodybuilding, uh, without enough energy coming in, muscle protein synthesis, MPS, cannot happen. You can't get to your hypertrophy goals in the same way if you are in that um, negative energy balance. And you also will see that your mitochondrial function plummets. You also see changes to hormones, in particular for females, but it can happen to males too. And you see higher amounts of oxidative stress occur because free radical damage requires you to eat more vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. And if that's not coming in in your food, then that's gonna change things. So just a little caveat and a little note to remind you that while we will be talking mostly about macros this evening, the micros that come along for the ride are really important to honor and understand. All right, so let's jump into learning a little bit more about carbs. And just here is a gentle reminder about carbohydrates here. Remember that carbohydrates are the main fuel source of the human body. We break down all carbohydrates except for fiber. Fiber passes through us undigested. We don't have the enzyme to break it down. All carbohydrates, be it a simple sugar or a long chain, um, more complex carbohydrate, will break down into glucose. It's the main fuel source. But we do have a limited supply of how much we can use at once and how much we can actually intake at once. Um, it is our main source of general energy and it's a huge supplier of energy for the brain. In fact, your brain requires glycogen or sorry, glucose um, even in a ketogenic diet. You will actually convert some of the fatty acid, uh, the, the, the backbone of it will be turned into sugar because your brain needs sugar to function. Ideally, we should have our blood sugar in, in kind of like a, a nice little window at all times. And I'll show you a picture of this in a bit, but we need to have a steady kind of balance of blood sugar to make sure that we feel good, that we don't kind of initiate stress hormones um, or we don't have too much and we start to convert that into storage forms. But the problem is that we don't really do that in our modern day and age. So understanding how to time your carbohydrates can be really helpful uh, for aesthetic goals, but also for performance goals. Because once we kind of surpass that threshold of how much sugar is in our blood, um, then we're going to store extra for later. And we can store extra for later in the form of something called glycogen. Glycogen is the storage form of sugar that humans will kind of pack up for later. And we actually store about 600 grams of glycogen in our muscles and in our liver, but also in small amounts in our brain. And the main reason why we store so much in our muscles is for that just in case scenario, in that fight or flight response. You need to run, you need to outrun a tiger, you need to get um, away from danger. You have that packed up form of sugar that you can unpack right when you are in that stressful state, right when we kick into our stress hormones, we can initiate the mobilization and the breakdown of the glycogen and turn it back into sugar and run away to safety. We can also initiate that breakdown when we exercise because technically exercise is a stressor and we still secrete stress hormones. Now to access um, this sugar, because glycogen um, is something that is stored, it needs to be kind of unpacked to actually be put back to use. So for us to convert sugar into glycogen, we actually do this when we have a rise in blood sugar that happens. So as you eat a meal that contains carbohydrates, our body senses that there's a rise in uh, sugar that might take us a little bit higher than our normal average of blood sugar. And we actually secrete insulin from our pancreas. And that insulin will allow the sugar to go into a cell where it can be used to make energy, ATP. Or it can be actually converted in the liver to make glycogen, pack it up for later, and store it or we can send some of that glycogen out to our muscles and pack it away or if we have excess beyond what we really need right we have a rise in sugar that's come in our muscles are full liver is full we don't need any more glycogen we can only really store that much uh, then we're going to make extra 
And we're going to pack it up and actually convert it into lipids, into fatty acids, and change that over to long-term storage because those fatty acids that we make internally are like putting things in a storage locker. We're going to get to them, just not right now. So if we're thinking about um, how long it takes to use our glycogen, it really depends on how active you are and how um, how intense your training is. But for you to, let's say, burn through that naturally, let's say like in a state where you were fasting or you were um, working through a low carb diet, you weren't getting any new carbs in, it would take roughly 48 hours for you to deplete your stores of glycogen. But during a more, um, intense out of exercise, you can actually burn through your glycogen stores in like 60 to 90 minutes, depending on if you're doing more of like um, a, a blend of, of strength and endurance training, like a CrossFit class or a soccer game um, or anything like that, you will actually start to see that that can be burned through quite quickly. But then to replenish that actually does take time. So the timing of how you return and replenish your glyc glycogen stores will be something that we're going to discuss today as well, because a lot of people aren't quite sure about how how to properly replenish your glycogen once your workout is over. So as I already mentioned, replenishing glycogen can take up to 48 hours. And so your rest days really do matter. And when you are replenishing your, your carbs, and we'll talk about the timing here in a minute, you also want to make sure that you are providing your body not just with the missing glucose, the missing carbohydrates that you might be counting in an app or your clients are counting in an app, you also want to account for the vitamins and minerals that come along for the ride in whole food carbs. So whole food carbohydrates are some of the nutrient, most nutrient dense um, foods that you can kind of get a large amount of essential vitamins and minerals um, into your diet is very easily and they taste delicious. So the goal is um, to really add in more nutrient dense carbs because while the starchy carbs and sugars will all break down into glucose, if you do not have the cofactors, you will actually start to steal from your own nutrient stores. And an example of this is magnesium, which is useful for relaxing skeletal muscle, it's useful for sleep, it's useful for brain function. But when we have more sugar and we don't have enough magnesium coming in from our food, um, we actually start to use our own magnesium stores to kind of manage the sugar that we are experiencing in that intake. So ways that you can find more whole food carbs would be thinking about whole grains. Rice is a great option in actually white rice form. We'll chat about that in a minute. Um, but we'll think about sweet potatoes, we'll think about beets, you'll think about potatoes, um, you'll think about uh, other types of grains, and particularly ancient grains, because there's quite a bit of nutrition in those, and even things like legumes. All of these things are going to not just be a carb count for your calculator, they will also be a huge source of vitamins and minerals. So if we're thinking about carbohydrate requirements, there's a huge push towards low carb diets. And for some people that can be extremely helpful to start to be more mindful of how you take your carbohydrates in and the timing of them and what you put on your plate. I see a lot of that in my practice with people who have diabetes or people who are um, in a state of uh, insulin resistance or metabolic syndrome type pictures or fatty liver. And those types of things might require you to start modulating your carbohydrates. But for the average athlete, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, the average intake of carbohydrates for someone who is sedentary should be about 130 grams of carbs or CHO a day. Um, when we're looking at that intake for the average person, that should be enough to give you what you need um, to make sure that you're replenishing your, your glucose stores and you're not ending up in a low blood sugar state or a hypoglycemic state. But the timing of that, even for the average person, really does matter. You don't want to eat 130 grams in one sitting. And a fun fact, a pop contains like 38 grams of, of sugar. Um, so a lot of people go over this. But the goal is to eat those carbohydrates alongside protein and fat and fiber to keep their blood sugar stable. But when it comes to um, the overall amount for the day, usually aiming for 130 to 150 for the average super sedentary person will be enough to make sure that they're not spiking their blood sugar and, and causing any insulin resistance issues. But for the average athlete, who is strength training at a moderate to high intensity, at least three to four days a week, you're actually aiming for about five to seven grams per kilogram of body weight throughout the day. And this doesn't mean in one sitting because your body has a finite amount of, of, of ability to break that down and store it properly. This should be timed throughout the day into three main meals plus a snack or two. 
and we'll chat about how to do that properly in the slides to come. Now, on the flip side, if you were talking about endurance, this would be way higher. So just take note that this is for strength training only. Now, during periods of extreme and extended training, so if we're training for, let's say, an event, you're training for CanFit West, um, you're training for like CrossFit West, pardon me, you're training for um, some sort of event, then you might require more carbohydrates. And getting up to about 8 to 10 grams per kilogram of body weight might be helpful for males in particular. But the reason why there's an asterisk here is that for females, we kind of cap out. So um, females tend to not be able to carb load in the same way that males can because our preferred energy substrate is actually fat. So carb loading does not work the same for females in both strength training and in endurance training. So something to keep note of. Now, when people start to carb load, um, you do notice that they, there is some weight gain that tends to happen. And the fun reason why that happens is that for every gram of glycogen that you store in the body, you're storing three grams of water. So the more glycogen you're, you're creating and storing, the more water you're holding on to. So that's why um, on the flip side, when people get into carb, um, low carb diets and keto diets, for every gram of glycogen that you break down to get into a um, low blood sugar state, so then you can start to access more ketones, you're losing three grams of water. So the first part of weight loss is always going to be water weight. The side note to this is that when you are training, hydration becomes really important because as you kind of ebb and flow through gaining more glycogen and then depleting your glycogen, you also need to replace that water. So we'll be chatting about water as we go through um, tonight's webinar as well. Okay. So what can we do to modulate uh, carbohydrate timing for better performance? Now, in a nutshell, the goal is outside of just the training window that I know everyone wants to know about, you should be mindful of how you eat your carbs on a daily basis, irregardless of training. It will extend your life. It will keep you from putting on weight that you don't want to put on. It will kind of prevent you from developing diabetes, fatty liver disease, um, having issues with things like skin tags, even uh, sleep issues, changes to, to energy and to, to mood. Because the way that you time your carbs matters uh, not only for your blood sugar balance, but also for your cortisol secretions and your sleep subsequently. So you can alter insulin sensitivity through modifications to your diet as well as exercise. So fun fact about exercise, if you are um, eating the proper amount of carbohydrates throughout the day and then you go for a great workout, you actually increase your insulin sensitivity. So you're actually becoming more sensitive to insulin and that way your cells can respond better and uptake more for use. Your mitochondria also love that. But if, let's say, you are binging on carbs at random hours of the day, your body becomes less sensitive to sugar uh, and insert. Your body becomes less sensitive to insulin. And then when you actually go to eat your carbs, um, your body doesn't really know what to do with them. And they end up getting stored as fat. It doesn't quite work um, the way you want it to. So you want to make sure that you're modifying your diet um, in a way that you can access your carbohydrates when needed, but also you should be able to be metabolically flexible. So the goal when you are working with athletes, if, or if this is for you, is to make sure that you are able to not only use sugar or glucose as a source of energy, but also to be able to use ketones because we actually use both at the same time all the time. We just tend to use glucose more and then in times of lower carb, we will use ketones. So in times of fasting or sleeping, we actually see our ketones rise. So you should be able to switch between both. And the term for that is called metabolic flexibility. A lot of people are not very good at this because they don't know what to put on their plate on a daily basis. So how do we modify this? The goal regardless of training, is that when you are making your main meals of the day, you want to have meals that contain protein, carbohydrate, fat, and fiber all in one go. Now, ideally at those meals, you want to have low to moderate glycemic index or glycemic load carbohydrates. And if you don't know what that is, I don't have time to explain it tonight, but in a nutshell, it's like how, how much that food will spike your blood sugar and affect your insulin response. Um, but those items are going to be more of like the whole food carbs. So things like quinoa, things like um, even sweet potatoes, even things um, along the lines like even turnips actually um, are quite low on the glycemic load, but higher on the glycemic index. I trust load more than index. 
um, those things, when they're eaten alongside proteins and fat and fiber, basically allow for those carbs to break down slower. And so you feel satiated for longer, but it's like a steady drip of glucose that continues use long after your meal. So that meal will basically feed you with carbohydrates in a way that it's like slowly coming down the assembly line and going down the conveyor belt um, for the next few hours. So that way you can feel satiated, but your body is still getting the right amount of carbohydrates without going beyond uh, kind of the amount that our body likes to work with because if we're not able to keep our blood sugar within this range we end up in a state of stress and we also end up in a state where we we overproduce insulin and can actually decrease our insulin sensitivity so when you eat a meal you should experience a nice gentle rise in blood sugar like this your body should secrete insulin and we put the sugar into a cell we make atp we put the sugar into our liver we convert it into glycogen into our muscles, make glycogen, and we can convert a little bit extra just in case to some fatty acids. But when we go beyond that and we have more than we need, we will see higher amounts being turned into fat through something called de novo lipogenesis. Uh, but we will also see that when we overproduce sugar or we overproduce, we have too much sugar in our blood, we actually secrete too much insulin because we don't want that on the assembly line. So we end up pulling a lot of that out of the bloodstream because we have this huge secretion of insulin and we end up with low blood sugar, even though we've just eaten a meal that contains tons of carbs. So ideally you wanna eat that meal that has that nice balanced plate to make sure that you're feeding yourself long after that meal is over. Because the fun fact about digestion, and if you've not learned about digestion, you can take our course and talk about it. Um, Digestion is simply the, the breaking down of parts into smaller pieces, your food into individual pieces, and then comes the part where you need to absorb it, and then comes the part where it needs to go into your bloodstream. So that um, is greatly affected by what portions are on your plate of all of those macros. Another fun fact for you is that hyperglycemia, which is just a fancy way of saying um, high blood sugar before training, so over consuming carbohydrates before training can actually affect your body's ability to regulate glucose um, after exercise. So not just in that post exercise window, but for days after it actually shows that it negates the effects of exercise and blunts your insulin sensitivity. So we have to learn how to time our carbohydrates so we're not overshooting how much sugar is in our bloodstream when we go for a workout, because then it negates the effects of, of exercise as far as exercise being good for regulating our blood sugar. Another fact that gets a lot of people a little bit upset is that you do actually want to honor that that restoration period, because in the days after you've done a really heavy workout, your body will be depleted of glycogen. And so you want to slowly but surely using this method, uh, be able to replenish your glycogen stores by taking one or two days off, because this is actually when your body is repairing the glycogen, replenishing glycogen stores, but this is actually when you're repairing and growing your muscles. And we'll talk more about that in the protein piece. But honoring that time and actually replenishing your body on your off days with real nutrient-dense meals really does matter, and it makes a difference. Okay, next one. So let's get into the timing, probably what everyone is waiting for. When we're thinking about pre-workout carbs for training, uh, the purpose is to make sure that you are satiating your glycogen levels, but without preventing, without kind of getting into that hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic state, too much sugar in the bloodstream. And you also want to prevent the onset of fatigue. So if, let's say, yeah, if you are training in the morning, you have been fasting overnight. So ideally, you don't really want to just start your workout on an empty stomach because you will actually spike more um, stress hormones because your body's going to go into a state of stress because of working out. And you can actually start to change um, your cortisol levels in a not so great way. So before working out, you do want to make sure that you do have a small amount of carbohydrates and you can experiment with this. And males and females tend to see differences as far as carbs alone versus carbs with protein. I find that females uh, tend to fare better with a little bit of carbs and a little bit of protein before workout or actually fat makes a bigger difference for females as well. Um, males seem to be fine with carbohydrates and a little bit of protein before workout. Um, but once again, everyone will be slightly different depending on their genetics, depending on their insulin sensitivity, and depending on their, on their training. So with the pre-workout carbs, we also have to think about the fact that your stress levels, your hydration status, and your current 
um, carbohydrate concentrations will also affect where those carbs go. So if you had a giant bowl of pasta last night and then you hit, let's say, 60 grams of protein or 60 grams of carbs in the morning before your workout, you probably don't need that because you probably still have quite a bit of glycogen from, from last night's dinner that was hanging around in your muscles now. Uh, so when I mean muscles, I mean like wrapped around your muscles, by the way. Um, so when you're thinking about timing, the other thing we have to think about is digestion. Digestion is an amazing thing. It allows us to get our nutrition, but um, because digestion is slowed when we are stressed and workout is a, working out is a stressor, if you eat too close to working out, you will feel terrible. You will feel like you have a rock in your gut and it's very hard to train. So it will also affect what you're able to absorb. So in the hours leading up, you can work with different types of carbohydrates to actually improve um, how much of that will be absorbed and used. If you have about two hours, you want to focus on more complex carbohydrates um, that are, and when I say complex, that means more longer chain, more starchy rather than sweet things um, that are going to be low or moderate uh, as far as the GI and the glycemic load uh, goes. And ideally trying to experiment with protein as well, just to make sure that you have adequate amino acids to support hypertrophy. Usually starting with about 30 or six, 30 to 60 grams of carbs can be a good place to start. And this looks different for different people. So this could be a banana, uh, which will give you, depending on the size of the banana, like 30 grams of carbs. You could also add in, let's say that to some oatmeal, and then you'd get to that 60. Or if you want this on the more lower glycemic index, then some berries with a little bit of Greek yogurt could be an ideal way to go. It really depends from person to person. But trying to experiment with somewhere between that 30 to 60 gram range is a good place to start. If you have less than two hours, then ideally a liquid meal will be easier to digest. So this would be your, your typical kind of pre-workout protein shake that would have some about 20 to 30 grams minimum of protein, um, easy to digest carbohydrates, and not too much else in there. You can work with fat pre-workout because it is easy to absorb so long as it is coming from um, something simple like a, preferably MCT oil, but if you've never worked with that, then we'll talk about that later on in tonight's chat. But you can also do it with even things like uh, almond butter. Now, I'm not going to talk about intra-workout carbs because you don't need them. And that kind of goes against what a lot of people hear. But during that 60 to 90 minute window of strength training, you don't really have the capacity to digest more food uh, during that period. And so your insulin secretions um, are actually blunted during training and your ability to actually use sugar while you train it is depleted. Um, so it's heightened after. So you can actually go really without working uh, um, with, a, with an kind of intro workout shake or anything like that. BCAAs are a bit of a different story, but as far as carbs go, you don't need to eat any in the middle of your workout because we're not doing endurance training. Post-workout carbs, the goal is to make sure that you are replacing muscle and liver glycogen that was lost, as well as aiding in muscle recovery, ensuring that you're also absorbing and um, using your amino acids because the sugar will actually help with that. And it will also reduce the stress from training. So having a, your um, having sugar post-workout will actually allow you to make sure that you're not going to dip too low because when you dip too low, here you actually simulate um simulate more cortisol secretions so by making sure that that doesn't dip too low you don't end up with stress cortisol secretions from low blood sugar so that's a really important thing to know so in the after window consuming between roughly 30 to 60 grams of moderate to higher glycemic index carbs so this could be yeah more like the dates um really ripe bananas um even things like for some people tropical fruit can be okay some people they don't like it um, in the digestive window it kind of depends um, but also paired with protein and in particular for females this part's really important and i'll talk about that in a little bit uh, but post-workout, um, this window uh, of carbohydrate opportunity um, will actually last for a little bit longer than you think. So um, we're talking more so about this with protein, uh, but the anabolic window is like two hours, even longer for most uh, men. For females, you've got a little bit of a shorter time frame, and I'll chat more about that in the slides to come. Post-workout, females tend to fare better with more protein than carbs, but you do want to give a little bit of carbs in that post-workout window. And I have more slides on that, so I won't. I won't dive into that just yet. As far as the ratio goes, um, with your protein to carb ratio post-workout, 
For strength training, it's typically a ratio of two to one carbs to protein. So if you're getting 30 grams of protein, you want to be getting around 60 grams of carbohydrates um, to, to kind of balance that out. But for females, you can experiment to see if two to one feels right to you, or if 1.5 feels right to you, or if one to one feels right to you, because it will depend very much on your ability to work with carbs. Because um, as I mentioned before, females tend to prefer um, fats as our kind of preferred substrate, but in the post-workout window, we are more sensitive to, to carbohydrates. So you can think about this as a post-workout shake with 30 grams of protein, some dates and bananas, nut milks, or maybe let's say Greek yogurt with some raisins or granola, um, a can of salmon uh, with some rice cakes and hummus, or even a, a meal if you're a little bit further away from your workout and you've given your body some time to rest and digest and you can get ready to eat again, maybe in that two hour window of having an actual full meal and you'd want to have at least 60 grams of carbs, if not more during that window, plus at least 30 to 40 grams of protein. And on that note, because we are definitely going to go a little bit over time, because I, uh, if you've never attended a webinar with me before, I, I love to, to share. So let's jump into protein. Um, a quick reminder, protein is the macronutrient and the um, when we think about the actual individual molecules that make up protein, they are amino acids. And different amino acids have varying jobs in, in the human body. So we need to be getting a variety of amino acids in the food that we consume because it doesn't just make muscle. And we often hear this or, or uh, clients will just often assume that you need protein only if you're working out or if you're an athlete or if you're a bodybuilder. But not only are certain amino acids good for certain things, um, if you don't have the right balance of them, they don't work, um, they, they, they work together. So if you have, let's say, limited amounts of certain amino acids, other amino acids can't do their job. So protein in a nutshell, with the concept of thinking protein will give me the amino acids. Amino acids are integral for muscle protein synthesis for hypertrophy, for the repair and recovery of muscles, but they are also required for non-structural proteins, like your non-steroidal hormones. So your insulin, your glucagon, um, all, everything that's not a um, steroid hormone is made out of protein. Your neurotransmitters, so your feel-good hormones, um, your serotonin, your GABA, all made out of protein. Your master antioxidant, glutathione, made of protein. Your enzymes that help you digest your food, your enzymes that help you breathe, your enzymes that help you break down your food into ATP, all made out of protein. You need a lot of protein. And your immune cells, everything is made out of protein in some way, shape or form. There's some sort of protein structure to basically everything in the human body. Now, the other thing that we use protein for on more of like that macro scale is that it's an alternate fuel source. So if we don't have enough energy coming in, just in general, we are in that hypocaloric state where we're trying to cut calories, we're trying to, to cut weight, or let's say we're just cutting our carbohydrates and we're not really replenishing that with adequate amounts of, of fat, um, then we actually will pull from our protein stores. And we don't like to do this, but it's it's the reason why protein is considered the longevity organ and muscles are considered the longevity organ because they are a pool of amino acids that we can pull from in times of emergency. Now. Um, when it comes to the food that we consume that has protein in it, almost all dietary proteins are fully broken down into individual amino acids, with the exceptions of things like collagen, which end up in, in like more of a, a tripeptide. Um, almost every protein that we consume will be fully broken down into individual amino acids that you can consider like individual Lego blocks that you can go on to build new things with. And the liver does require a constant supply. So if we do not have enough coming in, we can start to see muscle atrophy because, um, or atrophy because we are going to be pulling from those um, those stores. Now, on the note of protein, quality really does matter. And if you are uh, someone who eats animals, then opting for quality protein, we chat about this a lot in the sports nutrition course, is, is best. So thinking about grass-fed beef, you're thinking about organic chicken, pastured chicken, pastured pork, pastured lamb, um, organic eggs if possible. Uh, eggs are kind of the exception where um, if you can't afford organic eggs, it's not the end of the world in comparison to some of the other um, meats. Wild salmon, wild fish over farmed 
farmed fish, you just get a different nutrient profile. But those things are all going to contain a full gamut of amino acids. So your animal-based proteins, with the exception of collagen, will have um, all of your amino acids that are required. So that's your Greek yogurt, that's your beef, that's your chicken. All of those things will have the right amount of the amino acids, the essential amino acids that you need to function, that you can then make other types of amino acids out of. But uh, if you are someone who is plant-based, then this is something that we do need to focus on, especially if you are macro counting and you're thinking about um, their pre and post workout protein intake, because plant proteins um, are often not complete. So they're incomplete in the sense where they don't have um, the right amounts of certain essential amino acids, and essential means must have or die, or they have lower levels of um, those essential amino acids or they're missing completely. So that is something to take into consideration when you have plant-based individuals that you are working with, or maybe you yourself are plant-based, you do want to be mindful of how much protein you're consuming and the types of protein that you're consuming. So if we're looking at complete plant proteins, which means that they have all of the essential amino acids in um, relatively high amounts, soy is going to be the best one. And someone asked a question earlier about does soy increase estrogen levels? Yes and no. Soy actually modulates estrogen levels because it's something that's called phytoestrogen or plant estrogen. In comparison to the xenoestrogens that you find in plastics, those are negative. Um, plant protein um, soy, that phytoestrogen, helps to kind of modulate levels. And for most of the population, it's totally safe to work with. Um, but for some people, if you eat too much of it, it can just cause an estrogenic effect. It actually is quite useful for women in menopause to eat a little bit more soy, with the caveat that you always want to make sure that your soy is organic, because unfortunately it's a heavily sprayed crop. So soy is definitely the um, kind of king of plant proteins. It has been researched for being the most bioavailable and the most similar um, as far as its protein digestibility score um, to plant or to animal-based proteins like whey, it's still not on par, but it is the closest. So if you are reading research or kind of learning more about that, um, there's actually a PubMed ID that I've left for you here. If you wanted to just type that in the, into Google for yourself, you can look more into that. And it's a comparison of protein digestibility um, in plant-based versus omnivores and just talking about how sometimes we don't fully digest plant proteins. So you can learn a little bit more about that. But in a nutshell, soy being king, quinoa and amaranth are going to be a blend of, of carbs and proteins. So you do have to time that or kind of be mindful that that's going to also count for your carbohydrates for the day. Buckwheat is also considered a complete protein, but once again, there's going to be some carbs in there. Hemp and chia are often labeled as complete, but they're low in lysine. And that's not going to be good in the long term because lysine is really important for um, structure and for skin health and for kind of um, ligament health. So be mindful that that doesn't really count. Plus, you'd have to eat so much chia uh, to get to your daily intake. So when we work with plant-based individuals, quality definitely matters, but also quantity because the bioavailability and digestibility of plant protein is a little bit less because plants don't have fangs, they don't have teeth, they don't have antlers, they have chemicals. And so they have these cool layers around them that actually it's like their defense mechanism. They're just trying not to be eaten. So when you eat plant-based proteins, that outer layer of these anti-nutrients basically can negate your body's um, enzymes. They're basically called um, amino acid inhibitors. So they will actually stop our body's digestive enzymes from fully breaking them down. So ideally, um, when we have um, individuals who are plant-based, you do want to make sure that they are actually eating a little bit more protein than the, uh, their omnivore counterparts to um, kind of take into consideration that some of that protein actually won't be digested. So just this note on this um, study, just in a nutshell, um, it was interesting to note that lean body mass and strength um, were directly correlated to uh, available protein intake. And it was basically showing um, that while these two groups were eating the same amount of protein, they had very similar body weight, very similar exercise patterns, uh, but it showed that the amount of protein that was actually being digested and absorbed was higher in the omnivores versus those who were plant-based because the 
protein availability was 43% higher in um, the omnivore athletes versus the plant-based athletes. So that just means if you're working with plant-based individuals, opt for less of the processed meat replacements and less of the, um, you know, just unsoaked, unsprouted legumes and really try and increase their, their um, whole food proteins coming from plants. Soaking and sprouting can also be a really good option. So let's get into protein requirements here. The RDA, if you read this online, is far too low, even for the average person who does not walk, does not work out at all. Um, 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is not enough. That's barely enough to get through all the bodily functions that I mentioned. So ideally, for general fitness clients who are looking, let's say we're looking at our weekend warriors, they train a few times a week, they're looking for body composition goals, they're looking to lose some weight, tone, whatever um, their goals are, um, at least 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight would be the ideal place to start and the star here is just the caveat is that if you have someone who is obese you don't really work with their their overall number because that would set their protein too high so working with more of a rough ballpark or what the average person um, or if, they, if you know their lean body mass then you can work with that but usually 1.5 grams is a great place to start and it's usually a pretty high ballpark for a lot of people who've never been aware of their protein intake but for well-trained strength athletes, looking at 1.6 to 2 grams per kilogram of body weight um, show a huge improvement in not just um, hypertrophy, but also in performance and um, optimizing things like PR, optimizing time to failure um, or reps to failure, all of that. So you do want to be mindful that sometimes a little bit more protein um, can be helpful. There are lots of studies that show even up to 2.2 grams is beneficial for some. And in particular, if they're plant-based or vegetarian, you actually want to be higher, like 1.8 to 2.2 is what's recommended for plant-based athletes to compensate for the fact that not all of that's going to be absorbed. <clears throat> Another thing to note is that um, I know that someone asked a question about how much protein is too much protein. It's never actually been proven um, how much protein is too much protein we know there's the studies have shown that there's a, a minimum that must be had or or we will start to see like you know bodily failure but the upper levels for the average person have never been determined because the more protein you eat the more thirsty you get because for every kind of amino acid that you break out of the protein chain it requires water so you just get really thirsty and it does start to change digestion if you eat too much protein. So usually 2.2, 2.5 is kind of where you stop. You don't really need to eat four grams of protein per kilogram of body weight at some point. Um, yes, you will have more access to those amino acids, but you will probably start to digest a little bit less of that as well. And you might pass more of that through you. So usually sticking to that is, is pretty safe for most people. If someone has kidney or liver issues, then we don't really get into the upper levels of protein just because it, it can impair their, um, their kidney function further. But for the average person, there's no issues there. Now, one note here, and I kind of put this in bold, is that if you're working in a hypocaloric state, so let's say someone is cutting, and this is not something that um, I do in my practice, I don't work with bodybuilders for, for shows, um, but I work with a lot of clients who think that their way to get lean or their way to get to their sports performance goals or to their aesthetic goals in their pre and post workout nutrition is to cut calories and to cut um, nutrients most of the time they're not aware of how much protein they're consuming. So um, if that needs to happen, which I'm hoping that it doesn't because you can modulate macros and see huge changes to people's um, performance and huge changes to people's aesthetics without really um, getting into that hypocaloric state. But if it has to happen, you want to make sure that um, protein is, is pretty high. So at least two grams uh, per kilogram of body weight to avoid going into um, a negative nitrogen balance. So because protein contains nitrogen, it needs to be maintained. You need to have a, a, at least a neutral, but if not a positive nitrogen balance, um, not only for hypertrophy, but for everything else that I've mentioned, for overall health, for mental health, for brain health, for hair health, for skin health. Otherwise, we start to see um, when people don't have enough protein, it usually shows up as premature aging. So you get wrinkles where you, you shouldn't have wrinkles. You get gray hair when you shouldn't have gray hair. Um, you start to see changes to the integrity of your nails they get really brittle um, all of those things can be kind of signs that things aren't going in the right way um, people who are more likely to end up in that negative nitrogen balance would be female athletes plant-based athletes and those dealing with chronic injuries or DAM because it, it basically 
works through more immune cells and more um, internal requirements for protein, as well as digestive issues, because you might not be absorbing a lot of what you're eating. So a couple things to note there when it comes to protein requirements. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions and I know we're getting to the end of that time here, but I'm gonna keep going. If you need to leave, you need to leave. Um, I still have a handful more slides to get through and I'll kind of start to move through, through them a bit faster, uh, but let's just chat quickly about lipids and fats. Um, when we think about sports performance, we talk a lot about protein and we talk a lot about carbs, but we don't really mention uh, fat. And we don't really mention the timing of fat, but fat is really important. It is that third macronutrient that is an integral part of, of the, the diet because to be honest, you need it for satiation. It, it, it's a very calorically dense source of, um, of energy, but it also is very helpful for overall health. So ideally for most people, 20 to 35% of your calories should be coming from healthy fats. Women in particular need more fat than men, uh, but men with low fat intake see huge changes to testosterone levels because fun fact, your sex hormones are made out of fat. They're made out of cholesterol. So if we have low um, fat coming um, in, in our diet, then we will make fat, we will make cholesterol from non-cholesterol sources. We will actually convert sugar into cholesterol to make testosterone. So we do want to make sure that we have adequate fat in our diet coming from good sources because it helps to regulate our nervous system. It helps to regulate our cardiovascular function. It helps with our sex hormone cre um, creation, our stress hormone creation, and it's required to regulate our inflammatory process. So it helps in the healing process, especially if you have injuries. It actually helps to regulate um, how much inflammation is being made. So you want to think about quality when it comes to fat, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about fat in this lecture, um, but quality, grass-fed butter, you get a whole bunch of nutrients in there. It's a short chain fatty acid that gets used as energy really quickly. Good quality olive oil and avocados um, for the antioxidant benefits versus some of just the not so great oils. And we chat about this a lot in the course um, that I co-wrote for InfoFit, um, but the canola, the margarine, the low-fat foods, they're going to be chock full of things that are really inflammatory and that will work against you and actually cause your cells damage. Um, when we're thinking about fat and timing, fats are actually harder to digest um, because they, they take a little bit of a different route, in particular the long chain fats. Um, Post-workout it's really hard to digest fat because your body's just not ready to secrete those um, enzymes just yet. So um, the cool thing is that in that post-workout phase, your body's actually more likely to mobilize your own fat stores or your own fatty acids to turn those into ketones in the post-workout window, so long as you don't overdo your carbs, because fat and carbs post-workout actually have this really interesting balance, that if you have too many carbs post-workout, it actually blocks the enzyme that tells your body to break down fat and turn it into ketones. So that's why like the, the metabolic window of like timing your carbs and how much carbs is really important. Um, but also why you shouldn't eat fat post-workout because you will feel terrible. You basically feel like sluggish and heavy and you don't feel great because it's, it's gonna pass through be somewhat undigested. So um, post-workout, avoid fat, but you can actually work with uh, fat pre-workout. In particular for females, um, we, we like it. So um, in general, fats that you can consider for athletes um, to focus on, and aside from everything that I've just mentioned, is actually the short and medium chain saturated fats. Fun fact, they don't cause cardiovascular disease for 90% of the population, like we once thought. Um, but the MCT oil is actually really a cool way to use this pre-workout because it's rapidly absorbed and used for fuel and it actually increases um, the mobilization of your fatty acids from your fat cells to be turned into ketones. So we see a rise in ketone bodies when you use MCT oil but the side note to this is that if you've never used it it's going to make you go to the bathroom so you want to start really slow at like one teaspoon daily or half a teaspoon daily to begin and always pre-workout never post-workout. Uh, Omega-3s are also extremely important. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids, uh, the essential one is called ALA, and that one's found in things like flax and chia, but the ones that are extremely anti-inflammatory and useful for brain health and for um, aerobic capacity and for um, oxygenation of the cells are EPA and DHA. They also help to produce inflammation. Um, but these fats are not used as fuel, and I find a lot of times when I have worked with bodybuilders in the past or people who are chasing aesthetic goals, they're afraid to take omega-3s because it's fat but this fat does not get used as energy. 
It actually improves um, oxygen uptake, uh, uptake, in particular in endurance athletes. It actually supports glucose going into the cells. It supports growth hormone production, and it helps to reduce inflammation by supporting um, a type of molecule that helps to reduce inflammation. It's basically like nature's Advil. So it, and acetaminophen, it actually reduces inflammation inside the body, and it aids in the recovery process. So for athletes, because working out does increase inflammation and it can increase free radicals you actually want to have a ratio of two to one omega-3s to omega-6s and omega-6s are typically really high in people's diets from the canola oil and the fried food but for athletes you want to try and get that two to one balance this could be through supplementation or supporting with a good quality fatty fish in the diet okay <clears throat> getting into the last little bit here um talking about the male and female differences the research that was done talking about how much protein you need, how much carbs, how much fat, the timing of all of this was originally done on college-aged males. And then this was extrapolated to everybody. And that doesn't really make sense, does it? Because male and female humans have different hormones and different patterns. And so understanding that um, that that data might not have made sense for the female population is something that we need to, to go over. And there's a lot of new research that is female specific and it makes a huge difference um, to the support of female clients because um, they use energy differently. And also the timing of their cycle, if they are a menstruating female, also matters, it changes things. So we're gonna go through this in a nutshell and you can come back to this to dive into it a bit more because it might be a bit complicated if you've never seen something like this. But at rest, females actually use more lipids or more fat as their primary fuel source than males do, but it can be influenced and it can be trained uh, to be a little bit more metabolically flexible. And the same thing goes for males at rest. Glucose is the preferred substrate for males, but it can also be influenced and trained. Postprandial, which is a fancy way of saying after your meal, um, women tend to use lipids faster and absorb them faster than men. But after a meal, um, we, we have a better ability to use glucose after a meal than let's just say in like a snacking window. Whereas um, we will actually burn that as energy. In comparison to males, males will store more carbohydrates post-workout or sorry, post meal, and they will increase their muscle glycogen. Whereas females will just use the carbs and they'll try and burn that as energy right then and there, they're not really going to do a better job of, of carb loading or, or storing that as glycogen. During exercise, high amounts of fatty acids are used in females, so we actually spare glycogen. We try and, and save that glycogen as much as possible, whereas during um, exercise in males, uh, they're able to use more glucose and unpack that glycogen more readily, uh, in particular during anaerobic training, so more about that strength style of training. Um, but this also increases the amount of lactate, uh, which can lead to longer recovery times for males. But fun fact, lactate also can be converted into glucose. But uh, in a nutshell, males are much better at using sugar while they're training, whereas females are tending to use more lipids during training. So that's kind of talking about experimenting with that pre-workout carb versus fat for females can be really helpful. But on the flip side, post-exercise, females become more sensitive to carbs. So timing your carbohydrates post-workout um, can be really helpful to get those carbohydrates in, to replenish sugar, to get uh, the nutrients coming in from those whole food carbs, but also to make sure uh, that you're not spiking blood sugar in, um, in between you know, meals, that if they were just to eat that outside of their workout window. In comparison, post-exercise, men are able to mobilize fatty acids more. So if weight loss is a goal for males, then you can actually time um, and modulate, let's say, don't give them too many high glycemic index carbs post-workout, give them low to moderate, and then they won't, uh, they will be able to mobilize their own fat stores. Um, last thing is that with females, uh, the menstrual cycle is a huge discussion right now. And because males operate on a 24 hour cycle, whereas females operate on more of like a, a monthly cycle, uh, those cyclical hormone fluctuations actually alter a female's resting metabolic rate. So your caloric requirements actually ebb and flow throughout the month for a female in comparison to males that it's just 24 hour window. So fun fact that during um, the first half of the month, so between period to um, ovulation, you actually have lower caloric needs than in the second half, just by about 100 calories, but something pretty interesting to look at. In a note on training females in particular, this is uh, geared towards strength training, but uh, 
we can chat about endurance training another time, um, but to support hypertrophy and adaptations to training, females require more protein. They actually require about 1.8 grams per kilogram of protein, per kilogram of body weight, pardon me, a minimum um, to be consumed daily with a very specific note that in the post-workout window, it's 30 minutes for females. It's not for males, which is super interesting. So males can actually wait up to two hours um, without kind of getting into a, a state where they'd be pulling from their gains or losing gains. Females have roughly about 30 to 60 minutes to get in um, about 30 grams of protein and ideally something that's high in leucine. Leucine is um, one of the branched chain amino acids and it is extremely important for activating muscle protein synthesis. In fact, without leucine, you will not access muscle protein synthesis in the same way. So this becomes an issue with plant-based diets because plant-based proteins most of the time don't have a lot of leucine but you're looking for about three to five grams of leucine in that post-workout window uh, alongside the other amino acids so usually 30 grams of um, a whole food source will get you that or a, a protein powder that shows you that you've got enough leucine so in that post-workout window super important for females not for males we debunked that one today uh, males can wait so you can wait up to two hours fun fact Another thing to note about training females is that um, female athletes are more likely to be in an energy imbalance. We often see people counting their, their calories on MyFitnessPal or using their Fitbit, and they're aiming for 1,500, 1,600, 1,700, 1,800 calories a day. It's not enough for most female athletes uh, and for most women just in general. Um, this can lead to huge repercussions down the line in the form of something called red S or relative energy def um, deficiency syndrome, um, which basically is classified as uh, changes to your period. I see a lot of women who, who have fluctuating periods and think that there's no issue, but because their doctor has said there's no issue, it's an issue. If you are not on birth control and you notice that things are changing with that cycle, that's a problem. Um, changes to estrogen levels that also will cause that, that change to your, your cycle um, that causes issues with bone density with cardiovascular disease with muscles because your muscles actually have estrogen receptors on them um, It changes your stress levels it can actually affect your thyroid health and more so actually ensuring that you have adequate energy coming in is a huge part of focusing on training females because it just isn't as much um, it's still not widely accepted so I Deal um, calorie intake in general would be somewhere between 39 and 44 calories per kilogram as a minimum and you can experiment from person to person because this really will um, be personal but as a rough ballpark here's a good place to start all right last few things and we're almost done ish almost done um, hydration so we've talked about the macros and now Putting the last pieces together is water. Uh, humans are made up of water. We're over 60% water, and water is not only important for keeping your body temperature regulated, for protecting your tissues, your spinal cord. It also helps to increase digestion and increase how many nutrients you absorb. It helps to improve your physical performance. It helps your brain function. It flushes out waste, and athletes need more water. The more you sweat, the more you need. So in general, aiming for about 20 to 30 mils per pound of body weight is a good place to start, um, but usually athletes will require three liters minimum, um, depending on how much they sweat, if not more. Um, I find a lot of clients don't get enough water in a day, and this is a huge low-hanging fruit that can change uh, performance as well as um, everything for them, to be honest. Sleep, cravings, you name it. Uh, but along for the ride with water are electrolytes and electrolytes are actually the what brings the water into the cell so where um, we have the exchange of those electrolytes we actually will see water coming into a cell and without adequate levels of those electrolytes the water actually passes through you so someone can be drinking four or five liters of water a day but if they're not properly balanced with electrolytes that water's not getting into a cell so here are your daily requirements for electrolytes. Sodium, 2300 milligrams daily, is, is pretty easy to obtain through food unless you're eating a super whole foods diet and you're eating um, nothing packaged, nothing processed, and you don't really add salt to your food, you can actually end up with uh, a mild sodium deficiency. So be mindful that add salt to your food and unless you've got um, major blood pressure issues, add salt to your food. Potassium, far easier to become potassium deficient because 
we we don't really eat a lot of these things in a day, uh, but bananas, spinach, yams, avocados, pears are also great sources of potassium. Magnesium is another uh, one of our electrolytes. It's the second most common nutrient deficiency in North America, and to be honest, it's something I see very commonly in practice that people are deficient in magnesium. Uh, you can find it in nuts and whole grains and beans and cacao, but to be honest, uh, it's very depleted in North American soil. So of, of all of the supplement recommendations, Magnesium is a really safe one to work with, with most of the population. Calcium, um, you also need this to help properly hydrate yourself, and about 2,000 milligrams daily is a minimum. Dairy, sesame, um, seeds, beans, tahini, greens are all good sources, and ideally getting this one from food is ideal. You don't really want to be supplementing with calcium um, on its own, and um, yeah, we'll chat more about that in another talk. But if you want to add in support for hydration, you can also work with mineral drops. And this is one of my favorite ways to do this with athletes, not just the noon tablets, not just the electrolyte tabs or powders, um, working with a trace mineral source like concentrate drops. You can just give that a quick Google search and there'll be a handful of brands, concentrates. Uh, they are natural um, minerals that come from ancient salt beds and you get a really nice blend of a small amount of sodium, more potassium, more magnesium, and a little bit of calcium and other trace minerals. Um, um, that will help to properly hydrate you and that way you can take them daily you'll notice that you start to crave them once you start to take them too <clears throat> so last little piece here before we wrap up for questions is that we've talked about the macros we've talked about excuse me sorry um this <laughs> Ooh, sorry, um, we've talked about macros, we've talked about why the micros are important, we've talked about um, male-female differences, we've talked about hydration, but we also need to talk about the fact that you are not what you eat, you're what you are a product of what you digest, absorb, and assimilate. So you can be eating your macros, but if you have poor digestion, you're not going to be absorbing them. So if you have any of these signs or symptoms, or you have clients who are experiencing these things be mindful that they actually might benefit from some digestive help and that could be through digestive enzymes or going to see someone like myself to figure out what else is going on for this person so if people experience daily gas bloating feeling really heavy after eating finding food particles in your stool corn doesn't count but everything else does um eating too close to training and that just is what they do or feeling really tired after they eat then these just might be signs that you you might not be absorbing your nutrients um, even though you're counting them. So reminding yourself that exercise is also a stressor and eating too close to training can affect how, how much you um, digest and absorb. Aside from that one, if these are things that you experience or your clients experience, uh, it might be time to dive into that because you could be eating the best food in the world and counting and timing and training, but you might not be getting all of those nutrients. Last, last thing really here as we come to a close is the recovery piece. And this I think could be a chat for another day extended, um, but remember that muscles are not just made in the kitchen, uh, sorry, in the gym, they're actually made in the kitchen and they're made while you sleep and they're made on your off days. So while we talked a lot about the pre and post workout windows and, and honoring that and being very mindful of what you should eat pre and post, um, you actually have to be mindful of what you eat on your off days and also what you do on your off days and giving yourself off days because um, if you're constantly in reconstruct mode, which is what you're doing in the gym and putting stress on those muscles and tearing muscle fibers and you're not giving your body enough time to actually rest and restore between sessions, you're probably actually going to be losing out on some potential gains. So remember to fuel your body on the off days and make sure that you're supporting the factors that actually promote nutrient absorption. So digestion, getting adequate levels of sleep and managing stress levels will be huge to seeing the gains that you're looking for outside of the gym. I'll leave you with this, kind of everything that we've talked about, looking at that plate for most people, um, this could be a good place to start as far as getting that quarter plate of protein, getting in your fiber, getting in your starch and getting in your fats. This starch ratio will change from person to person. It might be a little bit more. Um, if you have someone who has weight loss goals, it might just be this or even less. Uh, but ideally, you're looking for a plate when you're making a meal that contains all of these macros. 
right? you have your protein you have your fiber and starch so those are your two kind of major classifications of carbs and you have your lipids okay we went through a lot today we talked about your macronutrients in probably some great detail that maybe you haven't experienced before we talked about hydration we talked about factors that affect nutrient absorption and hopefully um, that part about um, recovery maybe hit home for some of you so as we wrap up, um, if you have questions, if you want to follow me on Instagram, that's my handle. Um, I love to teach, I love to share, and um, I will take a few questions here before we wrap up because uh, I know that probably was a lot of information um, and maybe it was new to you, maybe it was old news, but I hope you found something that you could apply for yourself and then for your clients as well in the future. So let me close this and see what I can do uh, to help. All right, so nope, let's exit that. All right, so sorry, team. Stop showing screen. There we go. All right, so here is me. Let's see what I can do to answer a few of your questions here before before we wrap up. I know we went a little bit over time, but. Uh, that's that's me in a nutshell okay i see a lot of hands up um this is going to be difficult because there are so many questions from before as well so it would be best if you pop them in the chat box um stevie you're super welcome um Lori asked about intermittent fasting there's a time and a place for intermittent fasting um, for blood sugar management for diabetes it can be a helpful useful thing but as far as like fasting and training there's a little bit more evidence that's showing that the long-term effects might, might not be great for everybody so if you are fasting you want to make sure that once you break your fast you are still starting with a huge amount of protein alongside your fat and, and carbs and fiber to make sure you're not spiking your blood sugar by just you know having a donut or obviously anything like that um, and then you're making sure that you're getting your protein goals your carb goals your fat goals in during that window you can also work with cycling your intermittent fasting or working up um, to like a crescendo fast essentially where you're only fasting one day a week and then the rest of the week is normal and then you do two days a week um, and that way you kind of introduce it um, in the form of like not overdoing your allostatic load or going into allostatic overload, much like training. You don't want to overtrain. You kind of work your way up to being able to train more. The same principles can apply for fasting. Um, someone asked, is there lab work that can show if there's a protein deficiency or a negative nitrogen balance? <clears throat> not directly. Um, there can be some labs that show if protein, like protein is a little bit off, but there's no direct sign of if someone like that you could access. Um, yeah, you'd have to kind of work in more of a metabolic lab setting to be able to do that. So in a nutshell, no. Um, if 0 0.8 grams per uh, kilogram for sedentary individuals is not enough, what is? At least even 1.2, 1.3 grams per kilogram of body weight is a good place to start. But to be honest, um, yeah, the 0 0.8 is just far too low. It, it's usually going to get people to about 60 grams of protein for the day, which is just not enough. You're going to get cravings. You're going to be craving carbs. You're going to be tired all the time. You're going to be wanting sweets. Um, so if you're able to get that to at least 1.2 to 1.3, um, that's usually a good place to start. And just with the kind of the image that I showed you of that balanced plate of just aiming for like at least this much protein in each meal and like working up to a hand is a good ballpark for, for people as if, if they've never thought about that before. Um, someone asked, so pre-workout Weight Watchers bread and nut butter, okay, if working out 30 minutes after. That 30 minute window before working out, usually that's not even going to be through your stomach um, by the time you get to the gym. So the depending on what you're eating, uh, it's going to spend more or less time in your stomach. So if you're eating just carbohydrates, um, they usually pass through the stomach pretty quickly. Um, but if you're eating carbohydrates plus fat or carbohydrates plus protein, um, they, they will spend longer in the stomach. So 30 minutes is usually a little bit too um yeah it might be too close depending on the type of bread that you're working with um i'm not a huge fan of weight watchers bread just because there's not a lot of nutrition in it uh, but you can experiment to see if that 
helps you with your workout or if you notice that that feels heavy. Chances are that's only going to be starting to be in your small intestine. And then when it's in your small intestine, it still has to be absorbed into your, into your bloodstream. So that might be a little bit too, too far away. I mean, too close. I mean, um, is it okay to eat soy with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's? Once again, that's really down to a case by case person. And I can't really just, um, address like a very specific medical condition. Um, but there's kind of, it's out to lunch as far as soy with hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's, um, it's leaning towards more debunked, but, um, that I think is something that you want to discuss just on a personal level. Um, pre-workout rice crispy cereal keeps coming up as a good option. Um, it's super high on the glycemic index. Um, so it's going to spike your blood sugar and it's going to be something that's really easy to break down because I mean, even if you pour milk on rice krispies, it's soggy within like two minutes, which means that imagine that in your stomach and in your small intestine, it's going to be absorbed really quick. Uh, it's going to give you no nutrition. Um, and the other thing is that it's just going to be really poor quality rice. So um, I, I would definitely stick more with the whole foods versions and, and avoid rice crispy and just most cereals in general, because most of them are not great quality. Um, <clears throat> yeah. What would you suggest for those who wake up um, at 5 a.m. and who jump out of bed and head straight to the gym and don't eat until after they get home? Experiment with quick carbs. Quick carbs, um, like your bananas, like your dates, like an orange even, and see how that feels. Um, and it might take some time to get used to, but even just starting with half of that to see how they feel for a week versus then doing a week without it or trying a little bit of protein, even if they sip a little bit of a protein shake on their drive to the gym, experimenting. It's all a big experiment too, because everything that we've shared with you is for the average, but the person that you are sitting across from is not average, they're a person. So always experiment. Can you speed up the time it takes to restore glycogen levels after working out? If yes, how? Once again, your ability to store glycogen will be different from person to person or restore that uh, based on your individual insulin sensitivity. So there's no um, magic formula, but working um, with basically increasing your insulin sensitivity by making sure that you're eating balanced meals on a regular basis and then honoring that um, that timing of your post-workout window uh, where you would replenish with, with sugar right away and then um, making sure that that night you have good quality carbohydrates in your plate in higher amounts um, alongside the proteins, carbs, and fat so it, it kind of slowly will secrete and be absorbed um, as you, you sleep. That could also be a good option but there's no magic formula for that one. Um, I think it's a few more questions here. Uh, I read a theory recently that you should never combine starchy carbs with meat. So what are your thoughts with this? This is called uh, food combining. And for some people, yeah, food combining can be an issue because um, they have poor digestion. So uh, carbohydrates and meat mean that those carbohydrates are going to wait for that protein to be digested in the stomach and kind of broken down before things are going to be released into the small intestine. And if they have compromised digestion, this can lead to bloating, gas, heartburn. But if you have normal digestion, you should be A-OK -okay digesting this. So uh, it really just depends from person to person. Um, how do you get rid of, rid of the belly in perimenopause? Um, carb timing, uh, blood sugar balance, supporting stress pathways, and like reducing stress, um, lots more. But send me an email about that one and maybe we can set up a chat. Um, if I don't have access to healthy food after my workout, can I get quickly fast food, um, like Burger King, eating something is better than nothing versus missing a meal? If it's a one-off, probably not a big deal. But if it's every day that you can't get um, access to healthy food, then that would be something that would develop into a problem, right? Because you're not getting the nutrients you need. You're getting a lot of rancid oils and poor quality oils. So um, just something to consider there. Yeah. Uh, is there a golden time to drink or eat carbs and proteins after training? I think I answered that one in my chat today. And then is organic food really better for you? If you can afford it, the nutrient density of organic food is definitely a little bit higher um, just because of, of the, the the soil and the lack of chemicals. That's the other big thing is that you're not getting the chemical spray and Fortunately, that's sprayed on, on unconventional food, in particular grains and legumes are really high in pesticides. Um, but if you can't afford it, then 
you know, it's it, it wouldn't be the lowest hanging fruit. You'd want to focus on other things. But if you can afford certain organic foods, then go for it. There's a list online. You can look this up. It's called the Clean 15 and the Dirty Dozen. And it's a, a good uh, reference of um, fruits and vegetables that are going to be safest to be eaten conventional versus um, those that should be eaten organic. And that's a good place to start. Okay. Um, I think there's a couple last little questions here and you're so welcome for those who said some thank yous um, and what are some of the causes of not digesting macros stress low stomach acid um, low stomach acid is something I see commonly in practice and that happens when you have stress levels that are really high it happens when you overtrain. it happens when you don't sleep enough it happens when you have low zinc levels um, or those are just some places to start does having a high metabolism affect any of the macronutrient ratios? So a high metabolism can kind of be talked about in, in a lot of different ways. Um, but when someone has, let's say, a rapid metabolism, you, you will have to eat more, more food, essentially, because your basal metabolic rate is higher. But if you have like an extremely high metabolism um, and you start to notice that you get really sweaty, you get like, you know, um, really hot, your eyes feel a little bit weird, that's a sign that your thyroid might not be happy and you might want to go talk to a doctor. Um, but if you just have a, a higher metabolism and you have more muscles, you're, you're going to be hungry more often and honoring that is important. So that's something just else to consider there. Okay, I think that is it um, for me. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's put their questions in the chat, people who've um, said thank yous. I really appreciate you being here. And once again, you know where to find me if you want to reach out and learn more. Otherwise, as I mentioned, there's a lot more information in that course that we created. So hopefully that interests some of you and I hope to see you at future webinars. Thank you so much and have a great evening, everybody.